Inilah Television Brunei. Sebentar lagi akan disiarkan berita dalam bahasa Inggeris yang akan disampaikan oleh Muhammad Haji Hasan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening. The United Nations Security Council is preparing for an emergency debate on South Africa's latest raids into neighboring states. Also in the headlines tonight, the International Atomic Energy Agency has agreed unanimously to pave the way for binding accords on coping with nuclear disasters. President Reagan has used his veto powers against a congressional ban on a sale of missiles to Saudi Arabia. And the Sri Lankan army is said to be winding up its sweep of Tamil guerrilla-controlled areas in the island's north. National news first. A small group of pioneers in local village health care were presented with certificates today at the end of their training. The ceremony at the nurses training centre in the capital heard speeches by both medical and health officials and representatives of the eight village health volunteers from Mukim Sukang in the interior of Blood District. The medical secretary, Awang Harun bin Haji Ismail, presented the certificates. The eight village health volunteers are the first to finish training under a primary health care program for rural areas launched by the medical and health services department. They received four days of training in basic community health measures and emergency medical treatment. The Bandar Sribagan Magistrates Court has fined two people for smuggling. Chu Chin Xiang was fined $4,000 for trying to smuggle timber to Limbang last February. The timber worth $1,470 was confiscated. The other person July bin Jafar was fined $1,000 for trying to smuggle petrol. His boat and two engines were also confiscated. At the Islamic Dakwa Center, another religious lecture was held this morning. Ustaz Haji Daud bin Junet of the center spoke about the benefits of Quran reading. His audience was made up of mainly of students. The lecture was one of a series arranged especially for the fasting month. The police have appealed for public help in tracing a woman and her four-month-old child missing since last Friday. They are Dayang Susana binti Abdul Manaf and her son Omri Hazli. They left their home in Jalan Telepok in the capital on Friday afternoon. Anyone with information as to their whereabouts is asked to contact the nearest police station. A display of traditional Malay festive flower arrangements will be held from Sunday at the Language and Literature Bureau. It will be on until the 1st of June, and the public can visit it between 9 in the morning and 4 in the afternoon. The approach of Hari Raya has seen the customary increase in donations to charity, particularly to orphans. In Blight, the Orphans Fund received four donations today, totaling $1,100. In Tutong, there were two donations for orphans totaling $860. And in Bandar Sri Begawan, the Malay Teachers Association gave $500 to the National Orphans Fund. The fund had earlier received three anonymous donations worth $1,200. A Hari Raya sale organized by the Department of Welfare, Youth and Sports has begun as a youth center. The department's director, yang dimuliakan Pin Jawatan Luar Perkerma Raja Datuk Sri Paduka Awang Haji Hussein opened the sale. He said he hoped the public would contribute towards making the sale a success as well as give its support to government welfare efforts. The sale of cakes, biscuits, clothing, furniture and festive decorations is on for a week. The proceeds will go to the National Welfare Body and the funds for the disabled, blind and orphans. International news. 
and the United Nations Security Council is tonight due to begin an emergency debate on South Africa's raids into three neighboring states. In other reaction, the American Congress is debating a bill that would impose new economic sanctions on South Africa's white regime to try to get it to end apartheid. And the Commonwealth's Committee on Southern Africa has called on South Africa to compensate Botswana, Zambia and Zimbabwe for the raids into their territory. But South Africa's President Bota has remained defiant in the face of world outrage. He says that more attacks would be launched against countries that give refuge to guerrillas fighting to overthrow his regime. His government said last Monday's raids into Zambia, Botswana and Zimbabwe were against the basis of the ANC, the main guerrilla group fighting white rule. The ANC president, Mr. Tambo, in a broadcast from Zambia, responded by calling on blacks in South Africa to adopt total civil disobedience. Meanwhile, a senior American official has held meetings in the three countries hit by the raids to discuss ways of resolving differences in the region. The official, Mr. Charles Freeman, expressed the United States' outrage at the raids. We stand with Botswana, Zambia and Zimbabwe in our sense of outrage that these ta attacks occurred. We call on all parties to refrain from further senseless and provocative actions and to rededicate themselves to the path of diplomacy and negotiation. Foreign ministers I mean, of the five so-called frontline states bordering South Africa held a crisis meeting after the raids. And later, through the Zambian foreign minister, they called for sanctions against South Africa. The Republic of Zambia and the Republic of Zimbabwe. The ministers reiterated their call for the imposition of mandatory and comprehensive economic sanctions against the South African regime as an effective means of combating the apartheid system and of bringing peace and stability to Southern Africa. In South Africa itself, church leaders are trying to arrange peace talks between rival black groups fighting for control of a shantytown on the outskirts of Cape Town. The fighting has left 19 people dead and thousands homeless. The battle for control of crossroads has involved a vigilante group known as the Fathers and radical youths calling themselves the Comrades. The Fathers are believed to have the support of the South African Armed Forces and have been accused of taking protection money from the squatter residents of Crossroads. The violence which began last weekend saw hundreds of shacks being burnt down and there are now an estimated 30,000 refugees. The International Atomic Energy Agency has agreed to seek binding accords to cope with nuclear disasters. The agreement came at an emergency meeting requested by West Germany in the wake of the Chernobyl nuclear accident in the Soviet Union. The meeting in Vienna heard the Soviet delegate reveal that 15 people had so far died as a result of the Chernobyl accident on the 26th of last month. A statement adopted unanimously by the agency's 35 nation board of governors called for experts to draft a world agreement permitting countries to report promptly any nuclear accident that crosses national frontiers. A second accord to be drafted will provide for coordination of emergency response and aid in the event of a nuclear accident. In France, there's been an accident at a nuclear fuel reprocessing plant on the northern coast. Five workers were exposed to radiation while trying to weld a pipe that contained a radioactive solution. It was the third time that workers have been exposed to radiation at the plant near Cherbourg. The plant is the ma main reprocessing center for nuclear fuel around the world and spent fuel arrives there from as far away as Japan. Two of the five workers affected are said to have absorbed more radiation than the level considered safe for one year, but none was injured seriously. President Reagan has vetoed a ban by the American Congress on a sale of missiles to Saudi Arabia. The ban would have forbidden the sale of some 1,800 advanced anti-aircraft and anti-ship missiles worth $265 million to the kingdom. In vetoing the congressional ban, Mr. Reagan said American defense ties with Saudi Arabia had been endorsed by every president since 1943 
and he was not going to allow Congress to dismantle this long-standing policy. Saudi Arabia had itself earlier withdrawn a request for 200 Stinger missiles to try to make the arms package more acceptable to American senators opposed to the deal. Has withdrawn its request for the Stinger missiles. We have uh, more immediate uh, requirement for uh, the air-to-air -air missiles, the M9 and the uh, uh, Harpoon missiles, the anti-ship. <coughs> And uh, the kingdom is uh, determined to uh, provide its armed forces with the latest technology in defense weapon system. And that uh, principle has not changed as far as we're concerned. Sri Lankan troops are said to be winding up their operation to regain control of strategic areas held by Tamil separatist guerrillas. Military sources said that after five days of bitter fighting, the soldiers had extended their control around Army, Navy and Air Force bases in the Jaffna region. The Army had to call for air support to overcome stiff resistance, and the Tamil guerrillas tried to draw the security forces away from Jaffna by blowing up a big cement factory in Trincomalee after hearing the workers after herding the workers to safety. In other violence in the east, nine civilians and three soldiers were reported killed by Tamil guerrillas. With this latest offensive, the government admits there's been strong resistance from the separatists, but says the army is slowly but surely pushing them back. The troops have been pinned down in their barracks, and as they try to take on the Tamil guerrillas, they must contend with booby traps as well as bullets. Here in the jungle, the evidence of recent clashes comes easily to hand. The rebels are using rockets, mortars, machine guns and landmines in their bid to stave off the advancing army. Some of their hardware has a somewhat homemade look. But even ill-equipped and outnumbered, the Tamils are still proving a thorn in the government's side. Sikh extremists have killed at least 11 more people in the troubled Indian state of Punjab. Police said the 11 were killed when eight gunmen in a jeep opened fire at pedestrians on the outskirts of Amritsar. Police immediately launched a manhunt and captured six of them. The attack was the bloodiest since last month when police stormed the Golden Temple to flush out extremists. Meanwhile, in New York, a Sikh convicted of plotting to overthrow the Indian government is due to be sentenced tomorrow. Gurpartar Singh, 35, could be jailed after 10 years on the charge. In Beirut, at least 28 people were killed and hundreds of others injured when Muslim and Christian militiamen clashed in civilian areas. The clashes described as the worst for two months, hit areas well away from the Green Line, a battlefront between Muslim West Beirut and the Christian East. Twenty-two of those killed were in the city Shiite-controlled southern suburbs. At least 48 people are now known to have been killed by a tropical cyclone that hit the Solomon Islands. Rescue teams say many more were feared buried under mudslides. They said the cyclone, with winds of up to 150 miles per hour, lashed the Pacific Island nation for three days running from last Saturday. One of the worst hit areas was a village on a northeast island where 38 bodies were found. About one-third of the 300,000 population has been made homeless and the government has declared the islands a national disaster region. The ruling coalition in the Netherlands has been returned to power with a clear majority in general elections. The Christian Democrats and their coalition partners, the Liberals, got a total of 81 seats in the 150-seat lower house of parliament. The victory is seen as a personal triumph for the Prime Minister, Mr. Rad Laber. His government was rocked two weeks ago by public alarm over the Chernobyl nuclear accident and was forced to postpone ambitious plans for expanding the Dutch nuclear industry. The United States has expelled two Nicaraguan diplomats in retaliation for spying accusations against four of its diplomats in Nicaragua last March. The two diplomats have been ordered to leave the country by tomorrow. Robbers in Ireland mm -hmm. have got away with ten old paintings in one of history's biggest art thefts. One of the stolen paintings is said to be worth $30 million, but experts say the thieves may never get to send for their efforts because the paintings were deliberately underinsured to prevent them being stolen and held for ransom. The paintings were stolen from Rasborough House, 
a mansion turned museum near Dublin. The robbers knew the Rusborough House collection was heavily protected and they planned accordingly to hoodwink the staff. The gang deliberately triggered the alarm system, calculating that the administrator and the police would be satisfied it was a false alarm. But the robbers were inside. They backed up two trucks and began loading 17 paintings, which they unscrewed from the walls of three separate rooms. Tonight, Irish police are examining one of the getaway vehicles and seven of the least valuable pictures abandoned at a lakeside picnic spot. Two of the paintings were damaged, but detectives hope the robbers realise that the collection was deliberately underinsured, so that no ransom demand could or would ever be met by the collection trustees. The riot police have ended the occupation by students of the United States Cultural Center in South Korea's second largest city, Busan. Police stormed the building and arrested all 21 students. The students, armed with pipes and other objects, occupied all floors of the three-story building. They then hung placards from the windows denouncing President Yun Duhuan's government and the United States. It was the second time that the building had been taken over by radical Korean students. In 1982, two people died when militant students set fire to the library on the first floor. American cultural centers in three other Korean cities have also been attacked by radical students since President Chun came to power in 1980. In Chile, the military has snuffed out plans for a big anti-government demonstration in the capital, Santiago. Troops cordon off the city despite strong criticism by 65 European and Latin American parliamentarians. The parliamentarians had gathered in Santiago to show support for opponents of the Pinochet military regime. What reaction took the vast percentage of people living in Santiago by surprise. The troops moved in, closed off a 20-block stretch of the city centre and left the people to wonder. Many faced long delays stuck in traffic jams. The demonstration had been organised by a group called the Workers' Command. They had hoped that tens of thousands of people would rally in a mass expression of government hatred. But the presence of the soldiers prevented any real show of strength. Those that had tried to assemble were stopped, rounded up and taken away for questioning. The military action was concise and effective. Small bands of protesters did, however, manage to show some defiance. But their protests were only short-lived as they spotted troops moving in on board armoured personnel carriers, many ran. Those that stayed faced the usual volleys of tear gas grenades, gunfire and water cannon. Two Canadian women have conquered Mount Everest, becoming the first women to scale the world's highest peak via the Western Reach from China. The two women, both aged 29, reached the 29,000-foot summit last Tuesday evening. They began the climb on the 16th of March. The Sport Aid Flame has passed through two Soviet bloc ca capitals on its marathon run to raise funds for African famine victims. The Sudanese runner carrying the torch, Omar Khalifa, was greeted by government leaders in both Warsaw and Budapest. A large number of top sportsmen accompanied Khalifa on his 10-kilometer runs to both capitals. Khalifa's run will climax at the United Nations in New York on Sunday. His progress around Europe is being recorded by Mohammed Amin, the Viz News cameraman who, in 1984, first brought to world's attention the starving people of Ethiopia. Now, the weather forecast, and it looks fine all the way for the next 24 hours. The first satellite picture shows fine weather over the region. But on the 5 o'clock picture, there are some showers to the southeast of the capital. These are slowly dying out. Tonight will be fine, with calm winds and sea less than 2 feet. Tomorrow morning will be fine and sunny, with variable winds between 2 and 5 miles per hour, and wave heights less than 2 feet. And the afternoon will also be fine and sunny with maximum temperatures around 33 degrees Celsius. Wind northwesterly 5 to 8 miles per hour and sea 1 to 3 feet. Wallahu That's the end of the news. Good night.